for me, it was the first Goddard film I think that I saw, the first time I became aware of him. And at that point, because I, I guess I wouldn't have focused so much on directors themselves, I focused on the film. And so I saw the film at a place called the Arts Lab in Drury Lane, which was a sort of, a kind of, a sort of hothouse of ideas, where they had all these spaces. One was a cinema, one was a theatre space, also a music space. There was a, a restaurant, and, and, and a lot of interesting people were sort of hanging out there and a lot of ideas were being exchanged and so I guess the film must have been quite fresh at that time too and I think I'd never seen a film like it and looking back on it, I've seen it a couple of times, I, I, as a habit I don't watch films again, I watch them once and then I'm very happy with the memory of the film, I don't feel I have to do a sort of Tarantino and watch it a hundred times and sort of learn it off by heart. Um, and in fact, when I did revisit it, a lot of the ideas I had about it, I realized were sort of emotionally accurate, but physically totally inaccurate in terms of the images. I sort of got it right, but I'd switched colors and all kinds of things in my head in the time in between. Um, and the film has so many ideas in it. Um, each scene almost is like a new film in a way. And the way he's using the camera, the way he's using imagery, the way he's using sound, the way he's using music. Um, it contains so much kind of energy and so many ideas and the th one of the things I loved about Goddard always was the fact that he was very happy to, to have an idea and then dispose of it and move on to another idea. He's never been a filmmaker that wanted to capitalize on a success or a, or a strong idea and turn that into an industry in a way. He's demonstrated through his actions that he really is just, he's an ideas person and he's a person who likes um, philosophically just to discuss things in his films and then move on and discuss something else and then he also that he can change his mind. So as a kind of template of a kind of artistic philosophical approach, for me Weekend is so rich with ideas and was so important to me that I, I see it in this way. The reason why the film has endured so well I think um, is, is something to do with the filmmaker. Um, and it's a really good example of his philosophical approach. I think at one point Goddard said that you really can't, you can't really film sex and you can't really film death. So we have to find um, ways of approximating these things theatrically, if you like, cinematically, um, so that the audience understands what we're talking about, but we're not really trying to convince the audience that it's real. So uh, there's a theatrical, cinematic, approach which indicates that the filmmaker has not thrown himself passionately into the um, soup himself. Um, he's still looking at these things as ideas and what is in unique about him as a film director is that he has um, a better understanding of music than anybody else and any other film director that I, that I can think of. Not only his knowledge of music but also the fact that he understands in a way, to me in a very poignant way, the psychology of music. So he'll use music to, again, to distance, but to actually, in a way, to, by distancing and having that critical artistic eye, um, you end up, funny enough, with more emotion than a director who would throw him or herself into, into it in a very emotional, involved way. And sometimes those very well-meaning films that were made in those periods or other periods, 20, 30 years, 40 years later, when you look at them, in a way, they haven't survived for that reason because there isn't enough detachment um, now, some people might see that as a sort of form of cynicism. I don't. I see it as a correct artistic temperature. And I think that, for me, that's why the film to me seems um, very, very modern. In the same, I think I discussed um, that I find an album by Eric Dolphy, Out to Lunch, also um, has, has the same quality, has and allows it, you know, like like all great music, like you know, late Beethoven quartets, they have this same cool detachment, and yet they have such intensity of emotion. And I think Goddard always has managed to key into those musical elements and the way he'll use a piece of music, at the same time understanding that there's a degree of bullshit about, about visual manipulation, um, and that we shouldn't really take that too seriously. It is, after all, only a sort of poetic image or a metaphor for something else. And that if you can maintain that coolness, um, 
the strength of your ideas may endure a lot longer. And I've noticed that about theatre writing, I've noticed that about the novel, I've noticed all aspects of art painting. Um, all, all the examples that have retained a kind of coolness and a, and a controlled distance, sometimes losing your cool, but usually maintaining it, those are the ones that seem to have the ability to survive outside of their own period. The reason why I returned to Goddard and um, why I still see him as a modern filmmaker, as an avant-garde filmmaker, more so than most of the younger filmmakers who are supposedly doing that job right now, is because he understands the theatrical. In other words, cinema comes out of a tradition of theatre. It hasn't really departed from theatre in that respect. And within theatre, we have this contract called the suspension of disbelief, um, which allows us to go into a, into a dark space and watch actors often wearing ridiculous costumes um, and using ridiculous voices to project to the people at the back and using outlandish g gestures, which are called you know, the language of theatre. Um, we compare that with, say, a, um, the school of naturalism, and of, let's say, method acting that, that has emerged in American cinema, for example, from the, you know, Brando, Dean, and so on. Um, and then the belief that cinema should be real, backed up by a kind of technical sort of giant, which is really the backbone of the film industry, where cameras and equipment in general all go hand in hand towards a form of super-realism, hyper-realism. And what I love about, about Goddard always is that he, he says, no, no, we're still working with a theatrical tradition where the farcical is acceptable because the idea is more important than the false sense of illusion. And um, so with him, I'm always able to deal with ideas. And then despite, well, actually, because his ideas are so interesting, I may be bored very, very deeply bored by something he does for a period of time. I have no problem with that. And I don't think it's an issue of qualitative judgment about his film. Um, it's just part of the process because I know that it'll be followed by something that is absolutely scintillating. And I'm, I'm suddenly riveted. My attention is entirely um, captivated again. So um, it allows me to come in and out of his films in a way without this obsessive need for me to be entertained, or this obsessive need for me to be stimulated all the time, because I find that is the cinema of diminishing returns. By the time we get to the end of the film, I'm exhausted, and I feel I've been totally cheated by the attempt at realism. His concern with the audience, let's say compared to Michael Moore's, or any, pretty much any other contemporary filmmaker, is minimal. You know, I think he feels his responsibility and his loyalty is to his own pursuance of ideas as part of the great intellectual tradition uh, and that if you assume a higher common denominator rather than a lower common denominator you will and also if you don't sort of you know desperately need to be loved by the entire world that you can sustain yourself intellectually but in a smaller group of both your peers and your audience, and then the possibility for a higher level of, of dialogue and exchange of ideas is, is, is going to be far healthier. So I feel, I feel that these, these sections of his film where political ideas are put forward, they're put forward in a way which is a, a farcical. Um, at the same time, what is being said one assumes came from up the heart in, in, in terms of the political beliefs that Goddard held at that time and so on. But at the same time, like all great artists, he is aware of the fact that he must retain some distance from um, the argument. Otherwise, I think, quite rightly, you will be you know, viewed as a propagandist and someone who, in those kind of films, is preaching to a converted audience anyway. So. Um, I think in some ways he defies description with, with those devices. And, and again, 
perhaps that's one of the things that I'm really drawn to is the fact that I still find him refreshingly indefinable. I think he's a truly great filmmaker and artist. I think first and foremost he's an artist and I also think he's a philosopher and I think he's, you know, to me he's one of the major artists of the 20th century and continues now into the 21st because he's still functioning intellectually in a strong way. And that should be interesting to us because in the past we would have looked to our elder intellectuals or artists as being, you know, having very great significance within our community. We, in a sense, are in the cult of the young right now to such a degree that that seems to have gone, you know, by the by. I would compare this to, say, in, the, in, in a genre of music um, and songwriting. Um, I've found it very clearly defined. There are people who say, um, of a Bob Dylan song, say, um, you know, the lyrics, wow, the lyrics are amazing. And I'll go, oh, I can't say I've ever really thought about the lyrics. It's such a lovely song, and the lyrics seem appropriate for that song. Um, so you either listen to the music as a total or you listen to the words. And one of the problems with someone like Goddard is he uses text, and I think deliberately so, uh, uses provocative sort of statements which don't seem to make sense sometimes or whatever. I view it differently, that I think almost like in the, in the flow of the film, I have the feeling that he thinks it would be a good idea to cut to black with some red letters flashing. And so, what could the red letters be? Oh, they could be this. And I think he thinks of something very, very quickly. Um, and it seems at that time organically be t to be something that would fit in with the flow of the film. And I always agree with it. I always find it, I don't particularly remember them, but I, don't, I never have a problem with why that's existing there at that point. Often it's accompanied by a sound, a musical sound, which also seems to make sense. So it's, to me, he's a complete filmmaker in that he's thinking with all of his senses. Uh, never ever, you know, uh, biasing towards the visual, which, uh, to be honest, most filmmakers do. They think they're in a visual medium. They're not. He's one of the few um, artists in cinema who has understood the power of text, because text engages a different part of the brain from sound. So if someone says something, and you listen to it intellectually, you will engage in a certain way. If you then repeat that as pure text with a piece of music underneath it, a different part of the brain will engage in a different way, and you will end up with a different result. So he was pushing those ideas, and so often I think it's a mistake to sort of literally ask the question, what does that mean? It's more a question of, you know, does that feel correct to you, that he, that he went into that mode at that point of using text? And I would always say, yes, I, that's a point when I... To put it another way, I have used text because I've been influenced by him. And it, he's forced me to think about all those elements, how I use sound, how I use text, how I use voice, and so on, how the camera moves, as being all part of, of a bigger picture of how you make a film, not as separate elements at all. In other words, he, he ends up, I think, with a compound. Other people end up with a mixture, and it's a very different thing. I don't look at a Goddard film in that way of being having a message of good or bad or positive or negative or anything like that. I would say in overall, most of the time with most of his films, I come away with a, with a positive feeling, which I would translate in a different way. I come out wanting to make films, and I don't articulate in my, in my mind exactly why or what or what his films mean. I know that I come out with an energy. I might go into one of his films with no energy, I come out with energy. And including the last film that, uh, that I saw, Eloge de l'Amour, I found it profoundly moving and it reaffirmed all my ideas about filmmaking. And in a way, with great artists, that I don't feel the need to find a way to articulate why I feel that. I just know that I do. And so, what I loved about Weekend was a sort of wonderful and, and, and as time has passed, I think, you know, let us say, what is it, 40 years or um, almost 40 years since he made the film, which is pretty staggering. You know, as a snapshot of, of a sort of French bourgeois moment in time, I think it's emotionally pretty accurate. <laughs> Not just French, I mean, of, of our culture at that time. But as it is specifically French in its flavor, and uh, Le Weekend and, you know, the, the bourgeois couple.
you know. So even in their sex life, they're, they're bored with each other, even though he manages to make a very erotic scene out of it. It's an erotic scene almost because it's so boring. Or the content is erotic, but they are boring. And so uh, I find it far more accurate than a kind of um, realistic film from that period would have been. In other words, like a good painting that's almost a cartoon, there is somehow more truth in it. Because really what's interesting is the artist's interpretation rather than the attempt to impersonate. The reason why he has few obvious imitators is because it would require a considerable talent to imitate him. And I don't see that much talent on that level. I think, I still think of him amongst other filmmakers as a bit of a giant. And I think technically he's awesome. Um, people don't understand his technique because he throws away ideas and he doesn't capitalize. And culturally, critics and so forth are much happier when they are able to start to spot a film from a director, the fourth or fifth movie, and start to say, yeah, I recognize this style. Then they can be cruel from time to time, then they can be kind again. But it, what they very much like is having the power to uh, touch the shoulder or the, you know, the kind word here and there, and, and we become very dependent on their kindness. Um, if you have a filmmaker like Goddard who really doesn't seem to give a damn what they think, and every film he makes, he can say, well, if I want to change my style, if I want to start shooting on video, I'll do that. Um, if you create an unquantifiable style for yourself, then you're going to alienate yourself. And also, how can you impersonate that? To impersonate it, you also have to be changing your style regularly. So there are certain obvious elements. I mean, you know, the, uh, that a lot of very interesting filmmakers, Lynch amongst them, have literally almost taken scenes from Goddard from Weekend and, and just reproduced them. You know, the, the burning car scene in, in Wild at Heart which is a straight lift out of Weekend, you know. Other scenes with people running over cars, you know, I think from, uh, from Breathless and things like that that have appeared in, uh, I think also in Lynch's film, I can't remember exactly, but I know that, I know my Goddard moments when I've seen them stolen and dropped into other films, but what they do is they just take these moments. It's almost like, well, that's a cool bit. I'll take that bit, because stylistically this has become iconic or something. You know, and the way he worked with actors, the way he photographed actors, the way he chose actors has something that's been really absorbed. The way he uses camera or encouraged his cameramen to, to take liberties has become so part of mainstream approach. Let's face it, there would not be a movement called Dogma if there hadn't been a movement called the Nouvelle Vague. And we, I think, correctly would put Goddard as being somehow the, you know, more, certainly one of the leading lights of that movement. So his influence is radical. Uh, inconceivable to imagine what cinema would look like without the influence of that period of filmmaking. I would say to someone watching, say, Weekend for the first time, um, you will be confused from time to time. Um, I'm still confused by elements of the film, but I, it doesn't bother me. I, in fact, I quite like being confused by a film. I prefer to be confused in an interesting way than be to completely in possession of all of the facts of the film and be bored. You know, and with most films, usually about ten minutes in, I could probably tell you the ending, and I could spot scenes half an hour before they came up because most films are made in such a predictable way now that it's almost like a dream that just keeps repeating. I never have that feeling with Goddard. What would be interesting as you watch the film is to try and spot moments that you've seen in other films and you suddenly realize, oh, I see that came from this film. Because um, the film will be full of those moments. And just think about the ease with which he moves the camera and the ease with which the actors um, exist within the frame, even though sometimes it seems clumsy. And uh, things like that, that I think will will make it a different experience when you watch the film. If you're not going to watch the film like a predictable sort of Hollywood film, it doesn't have a predictable story. And it's more like a portrait, a kind of um, an impressionistic portrait of a period of time in which certain political ideas were, were happening. And if you think about the date of the film, you think about French culture and 
the culture in Paris at that time and in Europe at that time, if you know anything historically about that, the student revolution and the influence of certain intellectuals and so on, you'll realize that the film is so full of ideas and expresses those ideas in a very interesting way. And it, in a way, as a kind of entry into an examination of French culture in the mid-20th century, it's really interesting too because it touches on all those philosophical and intellectual ideas and cultural ideas and even the music in it. There's a scene, I think, with the anarchists in the woods where someone's playing the drums and you can see the whole pop, sort of the influence of, say, the Beatles and things like that on French culture and, you know, um, hippie culture and the way the, you know, a bourgeois society just absorbs all those ideas and turns them into just chic fashion statements rather than you know, more organically integrated sort of philosophical ways of life. So there's a kind of shallowness about the culture that is being commented on, which I think was correct and interesting. And then uh, to ask the question, well, has anything really changed? Is, uh, is that society that we're looking at particularly different from the one we're looking at now? So what it does is what any good film should do is it throws up ideas and asks the question, you know, relatively has anything changed and so I think to look at the film as as not as a narrative entertainment it's not it's a much bigger statement than that of course life without Goddard is entirely possible I, I see him as a luxury in the same way that I see Miles Davis as a luxury and uh, you know uh, Ernest Hemingway as a luxury there are certain there are certain artists who made an impression on you at, at a very strong formative part of your life. I think I was 20 or 21 when I saw Weekend. And um, it made uh, an impression on me in that, at that time I didn't want to be a filmmaker, but it, it made me enthusiastic about cinema because I, I realized that cinema could be more than just a Hollywood film. And at that time, I was really interested in, in what was happening in music and in theatre and so on. So it suddenly I went, oh, I see cinema is also interesting. So later on, through a period of sort of natural progression, when I started making films, he was still a reference and became more of a reference, in fact, because every time I saw a Goddard film, I would think something a little bit more about how you technically make a film. And to me, he was always the most inspiring of the filmmakers because I wasn't so much interested in the stories, although they were important. I was interested technically in what filmmakers were doing. And so I always knew I would be in some way challenged by, by Jean-Luc Godard, that there would be a new idea, that I might be bored. But I never, it never concerned me, the idea that the film might be slow or fast or whatever. I knew I would leave the film with something that I hadn't got from another film. So uh, he, was, he was a huge, and continues to be, a huge inspiration to me as a filmmaker.